the computer. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Kelp Restoration in Monterey FGC Decision Meeting webinar. My name is Keith Rootsart, and I am a conservationist and a dive master and a general contractor. And sometimes it takes somebody looking at things from a different way to, to find a solution um, that most people would be too, uh, too afraid to, to attempt. So uh, basically in Monterey, what has happened is that kelp needs cold, nutrient-rich water. And when there was less kelp debris drifting into the cracks and where urchins normally live, urchins ran out of food. They came out of cracks and moved into the kelp forest and urchins began eating the holdfast where the kelp is attached to the reef and the entire kelp rips up, ends up washing onto the beach. In less than three years, Many pristine kelp forests in Monterey went from this to this. We now have extensive urchin barrens throughout South Monterey Bay and down through Big Sur further south. So around the peninsula, there are about 800 hectares of urchin barrens on rocky reefs. But in South Monterey Bay, there was originally uh, 487 acres of kelp forest pre-marine heat wave. So that's kind of our baseline. But now we have 58.3 acres. This is as of September of last year. And 11 acres of that is at our Tankers Reef site. So it would have been worse if we hadn't have, have intervened. So this is the uh, urchin barrens around the Monterey Peninsula. There are about 2,000 acres of urchin barrens. And this has spread from this area with the currents to the south, all the way to Morro Bay, 100 miles to the south. So there's urchin barrens all the way. We have tried to get petitions to allow the Fishing Game, for the Fishing Game Commission to allow us to do something about this and to call the urchins uh, that are displacing the kelp. So we tried a petition in 2017, that was with Bruce Watkins and I, and that was denied for Monterey. Parts of it were approved for the North Coast. Uh, we revised and resubmitted it in, in 2019, and that was denied. And But then in 2020, we got permission, uh, and it became legal to call urchins until April 1st of next year at Tankers Reef uh, in Monterey. We applied for expansion, that was denied. We uh, also submitted a blueprint for kelp restoration as a restoration management plan, and that was denied in 22. And in 23, uh, we asked the Fishing Game Commission to prohibit fishing in the kelp forests that we're trying to protect, and that was denied. Uh, we are trying for a scientific collecting permit, and that is in a long process. I'll tell you more about that later. And perhaps in April of next year, we're, we're going to get results of that. And there's also decadal management review petitions and uh, we're submitting one. And uh, if that becomes law, that would take effect in April of 2025. So that's the, the legal landscape as it were. Now the Tanker Street project that was allowed for us to do, this is a little synopsis of what happened there. So in this light blue color is the kelp forest that formed in the year that we started in 2021, a, a six acre kelp forest formed just north of our cable grid. This is our cable grid, this red outline right here, it has buoys on the corner. And on that area, we, have to, we are doing the culling, that's our treatment area. And we uh, worked that quite a bit. And we also worked around this kelp forest, but we had to concentrate our effort on clearing this space and this kelp forest uh, became adult. And uh, it, the spores from that kelp canopy sprinkled all over here. And now the kelp forest in 2022 formed on, on the grid and south of the grid uh, in this area over here. And um, in 2023, we actually had some kelp spontaneously coming in these areas where maybe the urchins moved off and um, there's 
less of them for kelp to form in this area. We also very recently also found kelp way down over here uh, in the south area here. Um, the area of the blue hat shape, as you will, is the area that we're calling the urchins. So we spend the majority of our time uh, not working on the grid, but working within this blue hat area. And this is our performance summary. Uh, it's a little bit out of date here. Uh, we're up to about 700,000 urchins called now. There's 334 divers in, uh, that are volunteers in the program. And you can see uh, like some different metrics. You can uh, download this uh, if you like. Oh, I thought I had my notes. Um, I, I'll show you the, the link with this. This is on Tableau Public. The area in green is within that red square and the gray areas are the areas uh, outside of the calling areas where we did some work. So it's a lot of fun to kind of play around with this and you can see uh, what the current rates are and how urchins are called over time at what rates for the different years. That's uh, really cool. So the result is that the urchins at Tankers Reef uh, we removed so many urchins by, by calling them, and we got their numbers down dramatically. Uh, in the, the first year, by five months, we were already below the threshold that was required, and we just kept on reducing those numbers down. They have creeped up recently, but that's for another reason I'll share with you. In the control, uh, the urchins have kind of been the same. Uh, they're down a little bit, and actually they're up now. So uh, this is September of last year. Now, the giant kelp responded really well to all the calling effort. And you can see that at first it was very little and then it went down a little bit. And then you can see how the giant kelp, the units are a little strange, but this is kind of slope you want to a graph like this. This is uh, good kelp within the treatment area and um, it matches our observations, right? That's what, that's what we see too. So this is all done by reef check. And at the control, uh, there was no kelp. There was just like one very scared kelp uh, there. So the control is an area, just to explain, control is an area where we don't do any culling effort. We leave it untouched. I've never been there, but people have, and they survey it. So the do other you, thing we're- do you, do you have any data from this year? Cause that's- Yeah. Cool. September, 2022 is a year ago. I know. I, I'll, I'll get some new information out there. This is some older slides. Um, we've checked releases, some stuff. So it, it's available on our Tableau public thing. It'll all be available there. So good point. Um, we applied for a scientific collecting permit in 2022. And so far we're 18 months in the process. And what we're proposing to do is to have uh, calling efforts at breakwater and at Otter Cove, which is more towards the point, as this is Lover's Point, it's just in that cove on the other side of it. And then in Stillwater Cove in, in Carmel Bay and at Stewart's Cove, also in Monterey. Uh, these areas are, there's some kelp there we're trying to defend, but it is transitioning from giant kelp to bull kelp. And uh, this is a little detail uh, of, the effort that will happen at the breakwater that we're proposing. And it's kind of a, a weird dipper type shape, I guess, um, is uh, along the breakwater wall. Uh, we'll call the urchins around there and there's a little sand area. And then on middle reef, uh, there's a, a pretty, pretty large area here where uh, we can remove those urchins and keep that going. We're calling it Brigadier Gardens after Marge Brigadier, who is, uh, a great ally. She is she constantly is there every weekend, persistently like an urchin, and she um, uh, cleans up after the fishermen there. Hi, Steve. Hey, Michael. Good to see you. And well, then, Keith, the question about that, I I understand that the kelp is there's actually quite a bit of kelp over there already. So there does is that a, make sense to work in? It does because there's a lot of urchins there too. And um, the but the kelp that is this. there is kind of like a, you know we'll we'll keep expanding this area into the 
if, once we finish this, we'll keep on expanding outward into the urchin barrens. But yeah, there is some healthy kelp here right now that has urchins in it. it should, we should make short work of that um, in clearing those urchins out of there. Because urchins are constantly coming into this into the system. And if we don't stop them, they they will eventually eat that kelp. But don't, the reason why there's kelp that's there persistently is that um, this is the most dive site in California. And the divers that go there are probably calling the urchins as well. So that's probably why that kelp survives. Um, this is Otter Cove. Otter Cove uh, is the site of our previous project. That's what all these little blips are out here. This is a project that has patched reefs and we were trying to determine what is the threshold density when kelp can naturally occur. But the problem with the project was that we only had kelp recruiting on part of the site because we had lax spores, because this kelp forest over here that was all in this area disappeared. And so the site became spore limited and we had to abandon that site after two years. This is the current kelp forest. It's this kidney shape right here. And we've done some reconnaissance out there. And we found in, um, in June of 22 that there was a lot of urchins that were in that kelp forest and ready to eat it because they were um, starved urchins. They were empty shells, empty tests. But what has happened is there's these sea otters that are on this site right now. There's about 16 of them that are maintaining this kelp forest. And uh, they, they work weekends and uh, <laughs> they work overtime, uh, keeping the, this, er, this kelp forest uh, going by eating those uh, the urchins that come into it, get fattened up, and then they eat them. Uh, at, at this place. So uh, that's a, a good place for us to continue work. It's very accessible, but it's not always accessible. Um, our next site is in Carmel Bay, and that is at Stillwater Cove. Uh, this is right off Pebble Beach. This is their the little pier they have here. This is the 18th hole, 17th hole, and driving down. Golf balls everywhere. There's a kelp forest within the this little bay, I guess is what it is. And um, it's interesting because there's one kelp forest that has sand in it and there's no urchins in it. And then there's one that has a lot of rock and that had a lot of urchins in it. Um, it's been a while since we looked at it. We have to take another look at it. But the idea is to defend that kelp as best we can. This area is super shallow. We're not going to do anything in there. And this is the control area. Um, part of kelp restoration is always monitoring. Reef Check is our partner on this. And they will be surveying, you know, our kelp restoration work and also this control site that they've been surveying for the last 10 years. And um, this area was giant kelp and bull kelp mix when we looked at it. And now it's just all bull kelp. It's transitioned over. And then our fourth and final site, well, that's not, that's not really true, is uh, Stewart's Cove. Uh, and that is, uh, south of like butterfly house people are probably familiar with that so south of that is this large area of reef it is accessible by shore but it's a long swim to get out there so this is probably be a boat trip out here and it will require some uh you know logistics that are, are associated with that we also it's not on i don't have a slide for it but it's something in our decadal management review partition uh, not in the scientific collecting permit, and that is to call the urchins at Whaler's Cove at Point Lobos in the reserve. So it's it's a reserve. It's particularly difficult to get acceptance of that, but that is one of the things that petitioning for. And in kelp restoration, we're trying to employ different methods, right? So there's more than calling urchins. Calling urchins is one thing, but we also want to bait and trap urchins. Uh, we want to have commercial restoration by harvest of purple urchins for urchin ranching. Uh, we want to manage acid weed. Acid weed is formed on all of the sites, all over, the, in all regions of California. And it's, it has a pH of 2.6 and the urchins eat it and it's not good for them. It dissolves their teeth, but that's what they're eating. So can we use that as a management tool? to form natural barriers to the urchins migrating into our cleared areas. Uh, we want to remove invasive species uh, where practical and possible. 
Uh, the main one being uh, Sargassum ornari, which has been spotted in Monterey. And we want to make sure that if it, if it becomes there, <laughs> that we deal with it. Um, we want to uh, also do kelp enhancement techniques like kelp planting uh, by sporophyte bags. We put all the spore, the leaves in a little bag, and then the spores just circulate out of that and forms new kelp. Or by transplanting them. If we find kelp on the beach, we can... Uh, put it on a little brick or something and put it in the ocean, transplant it back. Uh, we want to manage the kelp canopy by cutting it. Uh, I messed myself up. And uh, I hate that. Uh, and prohibit fishing in the restored areas as well. Um, and that we'll, we'll get to that by changing the designation of the state marine conservation areas, state marine reserves, and by designating uh, the Tankers Reef area as a marine protected area. So this is a little bit of what we were planning to do this year. So we have, we had cleared all this area in this darker brown color uh, of, of urchins, and it was kelp forming on it. And we said we saw urchins come in and eat a lot of kelp, and our plan was to just clear this area and go and expand out into this kelp forest where there had been one before and keep going. And that was our idea. But then what happened was the sunset date came into play and the Department of Fish and Wildlife said, well, we're just going to close it down. And we argued about that and we got the Fish and Game Commission to uh, consider three options uh, proposed by the department. And uh, the first one is to sunset it. So it just ends. We're never allowed to come back. Um, number two is a new boundary. And this is the boundary uh, that more or less what they uh, had agreed to. But I think they put it like in the middle of this barrier in, instead of where I have it here. And then um, the third option, oh, and then this would be for five years, right? If we got this option, uh, uh, this is 100 meters away from that corner. And the other option is to just extend it for five years. And that's our preferred option. And what we predict would happen is if, if we were to, uh, this is what it's like at the present day. Right? There's kelp here, there's urchins coming in in all the corners, there's urchins, lots of urchins out here. We have abandoned the grid for now, and we are culling out in this area uh, to the east. Uh, that's the present day strategy. Now, if they were to consider, uh, and we hope that pending this decision, we could grow all this kelp and, and grow it all the way out into the option two boundary area. Um, it's going to be a bit of a challenge. We, we only have five months to do that. And there's a lot of storms uh, between now and uh, April 1st. Actually, is that right? we only have four more months to do that. Northern December. So what we think would happen is if we were to do the option one and sunset it never come back, well, the urchins, you know, we've seen it enough times. They're just going to eat that kelp that we all saved. And we don't, we don't want to do that. That's a bad idea. Very bad idea. And option two is to make a new boundary that's a hundred meters away. And what that would do is we would have to grow kelp way out over here, and this would be exclusion areas out in the, the area where we are um, over here and on the grid, we would not go back over there. And the scientists want to do this kind of thing because they are very pessimistic about divers' continuation of the project, and they're trying to kind of squash it and um, look at this idea that if the divers stopped coming, would the kelp survive? And that is a very half empty kind of an idea. Uh, a better idea is, you know, if the, uh, when can the divers not have to go back there, right? When is it gonna take care of itself that uh, our effort just zeroes out? That's a better question. Uh, and here is option three, if we were just to extend it for five years, Hopefully we have this kelp forest that we're establishing now and we could go and continue back onto the grid uh, in, in the 
April of next year. So those are the three options and we need your help. So the ask for this meeting, uh, if you're willing, is to uh, email the Fish and Game Commission. Uh, many of you have already uh, done that before. Some of you have spoken at the Fish and Game Commission meeting. Um, but by Thursday, that is our deadline, uh, November 30th, I think it's at five o'clock on November 30th. I should say that at five o'clock. Uh, just send a simple email. You could send it, send it to action at g2kr.com. Just say your name, affiliation, and what is your activity that you enjoy at the ocean? And it doesn't have to be very long and just support option three. So we option three, a five-year extension. And the idea is by, oops, um, by continuing the work that we'll protect the kelp forest at Tankers Reef and we'll feed the sea otters that are living on the site. There's usually two sea otters there. And uh, eventually we're gonna expand two more areas. And uh, and that's the other part that I just showed you. So um, all this kelp is high priority. So we wanna defend all of it that we can. Another possibility, uh, if you're interested, is to zoom into the Fish and Game Commission meeting. Uh, here is that link right there. And I can share that with you. I don't know. It's, it's going to work for me. Maybe if I press on it, it'll go. Let me see. Yeah, it went for me. So I'm just going to put it right there. And I will put it in the chat for the meeting. Oh, it's right here. It has a little thing on the end. So the link is in the chat for the Zoom. Um, so if you email to me, uh, action at G2KR with your phone number, and uh, we'll send you and everybody that has given us their information of what time it is. Because the problem with all of these is that we're not on until item 15, and there's other things ahead of it that may or may take you know a long time I, i'm saying 9 45 conservatively but it could be 11 you know so um if you give me your information we can tell you like prior to that event to the agenda item coming up and then speak for one to two minutes i say one to two because uh the president uh, sklar uh mission president can limit the uh time allowed for public comment. Um, at the last meeting, he restricted it to one minute. Um, so your time, you can prepare for two minutes, but you may only get one. Um, so be aware of that. So when the item is first announced, as agenda item 15 is now up, um, Rachel Belante, the deputy will say, it's open now and you have three minutes <laughs> and that's it. Um, to, uh, to raise your hand for public comment. So you have to raise your hand. And it's kind of weird because you raise your hand and then they'll lower your hand. And you're like, oh, did I do it? And then you hit it again. And now I don't know what happened, right? Maybe you're bothering them or maybe, <laughs> maybe you know, because you kind of think, oh, I thought I raised it, you know, but they did it for you. So, um, yeah, I mean, they, you know, Rachel likes to keep the trains running on time regardless of whether anyone's on it or not. So um, go ahead and, and uh, um, raise your hand at the beginning of that agenda item. And then once the um, presentations are done for that, then uh, they'll ask for public comment and then you can speak. So when you speak, it'll, it'll, they'll announce your name. And it seems a little weird when you first, um, they say, go ahead. And you're like, it's just you, you just hear your own voice. You don't hear anybody. So it's, it just feels like, like you're not talking to anybody. So people often ask, should I go? Can I start now? Am I on? And you're on, you know, just start talking. So um, say your name, your affiliation you're with the Giant Giant Kelp Restoration Project or, or whatever you want to say you're with and just support option three, uh, uh, tankers, 
for five more years and um, expand to more areas. You don't have to convince them like about kelp and how good it is and and you know all that kind of stuff anymore. That we're at the decision meeting, so they're just kind of looking for um, gauging public support, right? They want to make sure people are gonna want to do this. So, and then your third option, the most uh, difficult option, is to just come to the Fish and Game Commission meeting in San Diego. Um, it's on Thursday, December 14th. Um, it's a two-day meeting, the 13th and 14th. Um, I will be there at the Handlery Hotel in San Diego and uh, to try to see this over the finish line. Um, come to the meeting and you can hang out with me if you let me know, you know, like I, I don't know, I got a king size bed, you know, <laughs> we can go there. Uh, and uh, we'll have dinner. I don't know, whatever. Uh, or just come to the meeting on the morning. The airport's right there. I'm, you can Uber to the place. It's not very far. But it is, I don't know. I'm, I'm flying on points from Southwest. So hopefully they keep the cost down <laughs> if they keep doing this. Um, and so when you're there, when you enter the the, the hall for to speak, um, uh, submit a comment card. There's little green comment cards that they have at the entrance. Fill out the comment card. You want to speak to agenda item 15, and you give it to the staff. And then when that item comes up, they will call you. Uh, everyone who has a comment card to stand up in a line behind the podium. They they announce three people at a time. It doesn't matter the order. You just go up there and you can speak for up to two minutes. Uh, prepare for one could be the case, and the same thing. Your name, your affiliation, and just that you support. The Tanker Street project for five years and uh, expand to more areas. And you can, you know, I'm just giving you the basics of what it is, but you can expand on that um, as time allows. So, what I would do, and this is what I've advised people in the past, is when you go to speak to the Fish and Game Commission, either by Zoom or by being in person, is to, to come prepared. And the main point of this and you can read what's said here is to write your testimony down and edit it we're trying to be concise right don't use a lot of extra words and by writing it down in your normal voice and then editing it it helps to keep what you're saying to not waste words right and practice saying your script out loud that's kind of the when you have when you have time you're you're driving or you're just kind of you know go through it Say it out loud, and that that repetition will help you to remember it and make it so that when you're saying what you're saying, you're not like reading it. You're actually kind of like performing it in a way, right? Um, so time yourself too, because if you only have a minute, there's no point in having three minutes of prepared statement, and that's what a lot of people fall into, and it it really kind of annoys the commissioners, I think, when. When you just, they, they say stop and you just keep going and going and going and, and you're just reading from your thing. It's like, you could have just mailed this to them, you know, like why should they wait for it? Um, and then once you realize that you're over time or something, then make it smaller. Just sometimes you got to kill your babies, take out a paragraph. That's what happens. Uh, and what you can do in terms of if it's, one or two minutes is actually prepare like two statements in a way you have your two minute piece and then if he says oh you only got one minute then i'm only going to take these paragraphs um to, to um, be part of the, be your statement and um yeah so you can highlight the paragraphs if the time is shorter like make it in a different color right so like just the white ones have one minute and the white and yellow ones if it's two minutes it's kind of all right. This is this is my my tips too. Um, what to say is just to be honest about your experiences and to tell people what it feels like because that human element of all of this is is often so overlooked and it, you know we're all humans in this and we all have feelings about it and and in the end that's what's important about this is and that's what's going to get us over the edge is that if people really are sincere in their feeling and and can tell people what that is that's really very helpful and and be reasonable and 
and not hyperbolic. Like don't don't just throw out big numbers. You know, there's you know, this ninety percent or whatever. If you don't know the number, right? Like, don't just say something and then say, well, it's well, what you can tell right away if someone's being hyperbolic if they say it, and then they say or thereabouts or 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 just you know <laughs> disqualify with exactly what they just said. So um, go in there with the realistic um, numbers and things of how you know don't say it's all, all bad or no one's helping or things like that. And and be positive. Don't say those negative things. If you feel like you have a, a negative thing to say, you know, like the you know, commission's not helping, you know, you're gonna blame the officials. Don't do that. It's 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 really not helpful at all. And it's just gonna give them the impression that, you know, these are disgruntled people. Why should I work with them? Right. So just be positive. And if you have a negative thing to say, just just reach into your mouth and throw it away <laughs> and just keep it on the up, keep it positive, you know. Um, and I, some of the things that I think that should be said by people, and you can help with this is some of these statements here about, uh, let the divers, the volunteer divers do the work, right? Like we're providing this service for free to the state, right? So all they have to do is just get out of our way and let the divers do the work that they want to do. You know, it doesn't cost them anything, right? And other another point is that the divers can do this without bycatch, right? By by calling urchins, that's the most selective way that that you can do a fishery. Uh, is this done by hand, and it's not done with a a big net or you know with you know they used to spread um, quick lime on the reef and kill everything on the reef, make it into a moonscape, and then let kelp come and recover after that. So this is the best way we don't have a lot of bycatch um uh, keep the momentum of the diver effort this is something that that brian said at a uh, marine resource committee meeting and it stuck with them i've heard that repeated back to me many times is that we are gaining momentum divers are coming on board we need something you know to work on and we're we have a lot of projects we're trying to do so uh we have a lot of good work in front of us and we want to keep that momentum going and not use that negative question of what happens when the divers stop, because the divers are not going to stop. Right? We need to get that get that question out of their minds. Um, another thing that I like to say is um, don't play games with the kelp. The scientific endeavor sometimes is like a game, right? We're gonna we're gonna make it grow, and then we're gonna watch it die, and then you know it's they playing games is a trigger word for them. So when you say you know you're playing games with them, like they realize that that's people's perception of them, and they want to avoid that perception. So while you're saying like don't play games with the kelp, it it kind of frames their involvement. Uh, also, a kelp restoration is the goal and not the scientific design, and and that's what's kind of bothering our project right now at Tankers is that because of the scientific design of only doing this for three years and then watching you know trying to see if the kelp would be persistent after three years that is not our goal our goal is kelp restoration not to achieve a scientific endeavor right we are volunteers volunteering our time we are not there for an experiment they can do an experiment and try to keep up with this but that's not our goal that's the scientist goal and and that's how what has happened here with the Tanker Street Project is that the scientific design has overcome the practical nature of our kelp restoration. And Tanker's Reef uh, was to be extended. It was not temporary. That was the original concept. When we went into it and I started asking everybody to participate was that this is a kelp restoration project and we never considered it to be temporary. If they said, oh, this is just three years and uh, after three years, we're going to shut you down. You'll never be allowed to come back. It would have been a whole different story, but they just changed that on us recently, kind of surprised us with that. Uh, so, and uh, call urchins in order to meet the six goals of the MPA. Um, so there are six goals of the MPA to preserve biodiversity and uh, all the all the MPAs act as a network. Um, there's all There's six goals good goals of the MPAs and calling urchins is a measure to meet the six goals of the MPAs. Um, 
what's happened is that the department has invented a de facto contradictory goal number seven, that is don't disturb anything. And that is not a goal, but that's how they operate. They're trying to not get in trouble, not to disturb anything, not to have any bad consequences that are unexpected. So they're kind of afraid of it, but we are meeting the goals of the MPAs by doing this project. And if someone else says something uh, in, in the meeting that you agree with, you'll just reinforce that, what they said. And if you say, I agree with what they were saying, I'm just echoing what they said. And that, so you've effectively doubled what someone else has said by saying, oh, I, like they said, I agree with that. That's great. And that's it. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop sharing, uh, stop recording right now if I can. Um...